beginning as a Peace Corps volunteer in Malaysia in 1964, and then as U.S. Ambassador to the Kingdom of Nepal in 1969. From 1981 to 1988, she, Ambassador Bloch served as the U.S. Agency for International Development as Assistant Administrator for Food for Peace and Voluntary Assistant and Assistant Administrator for Asia and the Near East. She also was the Chief Minority Counsel to a Senate Select Committee, a Senate Professional Staff Member, the Deputy Director of the Office of African Affairs at the U.S. Information Agency, a Fellow of the Institute of Politics at Harvard Institute, at Harvard University, Kennedy School Government, and an Associate of the U.S.-Japan Relations Program of the Center for International Affairs at Harvard. After 25 years in government services, Ambassador Bloch moved to the corporate service in 1993, becoming Group Executive Vice President at the Bank of America, where she headed the bank's public relations, government affairs, and public policy operation. From 1996 to 1998, Ambassador Bloch moved into philanthropy serving as President and CEO of the United States Japan Foundation, a private grant-making institution with a hundred million dollars in assets. Beginning 1998, Ambassador Bloch shifted her focus to China, first becoming as visiting professor at the Institute of International Relations and executive vice chairman of the American Studies Center at Peking University, and subsequently affiliating with Fudan University in Shanghai as well as the University of Maryland and as ambassador in residence at the Institute for Global Chinese Affairs. Ladies and gentlemen, this will come Ambassador Bloch, please. Thank you so much. Ah, good afternoon. And thank you, Dr. Abahama, for your very fulsome introduction. I usually like to be begin my remarks with a question. So I will do so this afternoon. How do people abroad perceive the United States and on what do they base their perceptions? There is ample evidence from opinion surveys which suggest that the generally positive international American image from the 1950s to 2000 decidedly moved south or negative after 2002. The Pew Global Attitudes Project, which has been surveying views of the United States and the American people since 2002, chronicled the rise of anti-Americanism around the world when favorable ratings of the United States plunged in many countries following the invasion of Iraq and remained low through 2008. This is brought into sharpest relief in the Arab Muslim world, where large majorities in Egypt, Morocco, and Saudi Arabia have viewed George W. Bush as a greater threat to the world order than Osama bin Laden. In 2009, there was a rebound of America's global image in many parts of the world, except for the Muslim world, reflecting the popularity of Barack Obama. Now, I hope I am not repeating anything for you, since you've had such a huge and very rich uh, number of speakers. So just raise your hands when you think you've heard it already. Global opinion of Obama, however, has slipped. And approval of his policies has fallen since 2009, significantly in China and Mexico. The global financial crisis and the steady rise of China have further eroded international perceptions of America's standing, especially US economic power. Many especially some of America's major European allies, increasingly see China as the world's 
economic leader. How many of you here believe that? Nobody. Very few. But there is some good news. Polling data also shows, I'm sorry, that's my cell phone. I should turn it off, dump my purse somewhere. <laughs> Nobody ever calls me, you know, when it's, when it's uh, convenient. But there is some good news. Polling data also show an abundance of evidence that the unhappiness with the U.S. is not a rejection of U.S. values. In a 2007 BBC World Service poll, countries surveyed view the American people much more positively than the country as a whole. Even in Muslim countries, people around the world were saying that the problems they had with the U.S. concerned its policies, not its values. James Ogbe, president of the Arab American Institute, whose brother founded the Zogby Poll, explained further, it wasn't American values or people that had caused the image of the United States to crater. America's overall ranking sank because of the incredibly low marks Arabs gave to U.S. policy toward Arab nations generally and Palestinians specifically. The 2012 Pew Global Attitude Survey confirmed that even in many countries where overall ratings for the United States remain low, certain aspects of American soft power are often well regarded. For instance, the American way of doing business is especially popular in the Arab world, particularly in Lebanon, Tunisia, Jordan, and Egypt. U.S. science and technology continue to be admired. American pop culture and democratic ideas are particularly popular among young people under 30. As Stephen Cole, director of the program on international policy attitudes explained, he was testifying before the House Committee of Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on International Organizations. This support for American values has deep roots that go back to the period immediately after World War II. At that time, the U.S. was so overwhelmingly powerful relative to the rest of the world that it would have been able to impose an American empire. Instead, the U.S. championed a world order that has become widely accepted based on international law, democracy, free enterprise, and free trade. It promoted respect for human rights and the United Nations that prohibited unilateral use of force except in self-defense and respect for national sovereignty. And through its aid, programs the U.S. sought to integrate uh, poor countries into the international economy. America's promotion of democracy around the world has borne fruit. Since the fall of the Berlin Wall, the conventional wisdom today is that democracy may have its problems, but it is still better than any other form of government. Of course, how you define democracy is another question. The fact remains that America's image has lost its luster, but American soft power remains strong. This speaks to the importance of cultural diplomacy, which has, as you all know, played a key role in shaping national images, including America's. It is accepted in most countries today that culture is an essential component of diplomacy. Senator William Fulbright, by the way, how many of you have been Fulbrighters? Oh, a few, only, a, only one. Well, after whom one of the most inspired exchange programs in the world is named, wrote in 1964, foreign policy cannot be based on military posture and diplomatic activities alone in today's world. The shape of the world a generation from now 
will be influenced far more by how well we communicate the values of our society to others than by our military, our diplomatic superiority. How right he was. Senator Fulbright has given us as good a definition of cultural diplomacy as anyone. Political scientist and author Milton C. Cummings, if you're a part of ICD, you know this, further defined cultural diplomacy as, and I quote, the exchange of ideas, information, values, systems, traditions, beliefs, and other aspects of culture with the intention of fostering mutual understanding. However, I question whether communication in and of itself is sufficient for cultural diplomacy to be effective. As Edward R. Morrill, probably America's most distinguished and renowned broadcast journalist and former director of the US Information Agency, said, the US will be judged on what it did rather than what it said. Clearly, the failure of the Bush administration to gain support for its war on terror and its attempts to use Madison Avenue techniques to address the anti-Americanism around the world is a case in point. How many of you remember Charlotte Beers? <laughs> Only one, I must be talking about history. Most of you are probably too young. She was a celebrated queen of branding who was named Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs within weeks of September 11. She became the Bush administration's czar for selling its war on terror. The problem of why they hate us was rephrased in ad speak as how we reposition the brand. The former chairwoman of the J. Walter Thompson Worldwide Advertising Agency turned cultural and public diplomacy into a campaign to win market shares from the Taliban. She made a good case for cultural diplomacy before Congress when she testified and said, a poor perception of the US leads to unrest and unrest has proven to be a threat to our national and international security. Congress responded by giving the administration $520 million to focus on the campaign to repair America's broken image, particularly in the Arab and Muslim world, and sell the citizens of the world on the virtues of American values. But there were many skeptics, including me, William J. Drake of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace spoke for many when he said, I just find the notion that you can sell Uncle Sam like Uncle Ben's highly problematic. You recall that on her appointment, U.S. Secretary of State Colin Power quipped that Beers had convinced him to buy Uncle Ben's rice have any of you tasted Uncle Ben's rice? I'm, a Chine I'm Chinese. I wouldn't touch it for the world, no matter what the ad said. Paul went on to say, we are selling a product. We need someone who can rebound or rebrand American foreign policy, rebound too, and rebrand diplomacy. As we all know, it did not work. But Beers does not deserve all the blame. While $520 million is not peanuts, it doesn't compare with what the US had to work with immediately after World War II, when cultural diplomacy went hand in hand with the $13 billion in Marshall Aid Plan. 13 billion in the, in the 50s is now more than 60 billion, I believe today. Throughout the Cold War, the State Department dispatched cultural missions including exhibitions of abstract expressionist art, uh, staged trade fairs with model homes and supermarkets, and named Duke Ellington and Louis Armstrong, among others, 
as ambassadors of the American way of life. But the world has changed in the best of circumstances. It is hard for the government's voice to be heard among the cacophony of noise from social media and so many competing messages from so many sources saying so many things. Also, advertising um, is a one-way street. Effective cultural exchange, by contrast, depends on engaging others in dialogue. And exchanges make a difference to emerging public leaders abroad, not to mention foreign opinion makers and the public generally. Advertising, when disconnected from cultural exchange, is treated as just more background noise to be ignored or even suspected as propaganda. The bottom line is that advertising is only as good as a product being sold. The world has not been buying the Iraq War. There was nothing wrong with America's brand. The problem was the product. The attractiveness of the idea of America has remained relatively constant. There is no clear finding in polling data that competing models of politics and policy by China, Europe, or Russia have become ascendant as the American model continues to have strong appeal. After one and a half years on the job, Charlotte Beers resigned for health reasons. Beers was re awarded the Distinguished Service Medal by Secretary of State Colin Powell when she stepped down despite lack of praise for her work elsewhere. The legacy of her approach can be summed up by cultural diplomacy expert and author Nancy Sloan Stowe's comment. Rebranding America is one strategy to improve the US image, but it may not be the best. The failure of Charlotte Beers to sell US foreign policy should not diminish the importance of cultural diplomacy. It was the failure of public relations diplomacy, not cultural diplomacy. Beer saw America's tattered international image as little more than a communications problem. From her Madison Avenue lens, she thought the problem could be fixed by just getting out there and telling the story. In fact, the problem may just have been the opposite. America's marketing of itself has been too effective. Around the world, school children can recite America's, America's claim to democracy, liberty, and equal opportunity. I knew that as an immigrant. And these children also flock to McDonald's for American hamburgers and badger their parents to buy them Nike to improve their athletic progress. Just as they expect McDonald's and Nike to deliver on their products, so they expect the US to live up to its claims. The invasion of Iraq served as a lightning rod that galvanized global perceptions of a US that failed to live up to how we portrayed ourselves. In the interest of time, uh, let me just move on to say that the problem with America's image is not just communication. It's policy execution. Our policies did not coincide with our words. In this regard, America's image faces a tough new test. The economic meltdown of 2008 and 9 has shattered global confidence in capitalism and the US economic model, threatening to undermine the view of the fairness, justice, and legitimacy of democratic capitalism. Europeans are now touting the so-called Beijing consensus, not the Washington consensus. A liberal Chinese economist recently bemoaned that the popular view is that the American model is failing. The good news is that they don't see us as having failed already. During the last five decades, America's image has seen its ups and downs, but typically has bounced back because of the resilience of American values. 
This time, how America responds to the global financial crisis is critical. If the United States cannot put its own economic house in order, and the growing budget deficits require cuts, for example, in economic or military assistance, U.S. image and standing may further decline. Resources also matter. As the U.S. suffered the greatest damage to its international image and reputation in history, government leaders once again turned to cultural diplomacy to repair the harm done. But what happened? They found cultural diplomacy a shadow of its former self. As you know, the budgets were drastically slashed. In 1999, USIA was voted into the State Department. And there was not much left for our government leaders to call on to repair U.S. image abroad. Uh, again, because I want you to have time for a few questions, let me just jump to another question for you to start the discussion. Do you think the U.S. can repair or revive, I should say, cultural diplomacy and bring it back from its current underutilized and marginalized position? I ask you that question because, as you know, there are many voices out there calling for a return to official cultural diplomacy in order to combat the misinformation and misunderstanding around the world and to work for a world of peace and stability. So the question is for you. Go ahead. Hello. Thank you so much for your speech, Madam Ambassador. Um, my name is Basmana Tribi. Again, I'm going to introduce myself. I'm a graduate student at Cairo, at the American University in Cairo. And um, I think what you're, the question that you're addressing can only be uh, feasible if the soft power and the hard power are aligned within the same framework or within or towards the same direction. And I think this correct, this can correct the, the misperception of uh, or the uh, the decrease in the branding uh, towards the U.S. image and quote unquote the American dream uh, that's perceived worldwide. Uh, as a Middle Eastern woman, and um, I can I can relate so much to this perspective and to this debate because it's hard for me to explain to people that there's nothing against us per se as um, as a population, as a culture, as a religion, but it's more or less how you can relate to such a culture and what you can take the most of, or what you can take the most relevant of, and apply it to your understanding of your morals and principles. So I think that the hardest part of it is to align both soft power and hard power. And I don't see um, an, easy qu an easy answer to that. It's more or less just um, an idea. But uh, the actual policies to do so, um, I think that's very, very difficult. But just uh, that's a comment that I want to make. Thank you so much for your time. Another Several yeah. questions. Hi. Um, my name is Nadine al Nabli. I'm American Egyptian, um, and I currently study in Germany. Um, I just wanted to also comment on what um, Besma just said. Um, I agree that the U.S. has failed drastically over the past few years to live up to the values that it preaches. It and that's what I can say representing, because I grew up in Egypt, I can, uh, representing the Egyptian people, at least to a certain extent, that a lot of hostility that, it, that the Egyptian people has towards the U.S. is not only the fact that it doesn't live up to what it preaches within its country, but also that it, it, it really tries to um, play a role in what takes place in terms of politics or worldwide, and yet 
it claims it's preaching democracy, but for example, to support a dictator in Egypt for 30 years, financially, at least to support the government, that's what people are like, if you leave us this space to grow, that's more or less what people want. They don't, it's not only that they need to see a change in policy, but they also need to see that the US is leaving, is accepting the uh, people for the gov government for what it is and leaving the space for the people to grow to a certain extent. So I think it's just not, it's also giving freedom to the people, to, to the other world, to the rest of the world to emerge. At the women political at the women political uh -huh. empowerment yeah. uh, program back home in Cairo, and um, we had a couple of advocacy training for women, Egyptian women, and they were held by American uh, experts and a European. And uh, one lady came to me, and once she said, "Like, don't they get paid eighty percent of what women of what men get paid in their country, and I get paid as much as a man does back home in Egypt? So don't you think it's a bit hypocritical for someone to come over?" from the States and come talk to me about equal rights and I get paid as much as Amanda's, regardless of what I do. And I was like, uh, I know, and I get the point, but at the same time, she has the chance to do something that we don't. So listen to her experience and learn and maybe apply and teach it to someone else back home in rural areas or urban areas. You're, yeah, you're both just but, uh, really reinforcing what I was trying to say, <coughs> that Thank you, you know, words and policies have to match. But my question is, can the United States revive its cultural diplomacy? Yes. I'll take the second perspective. Okay. Um, in your lecture, you spoke uh, mainly about policy shaping cultural mm -hmm. diplomacy, but uh, I think if we want to revive it, uh, not to discredit ambassadors in any way, but <laughs> The United States' most okay. vocal <laughs> international representatives are their military personnel. So uh, why aren't we investing in more programs uh, to give to help the military have a more positive image abroad, um, where they can get personal relationships with people in foreign countries uh, and really work on cultural diplomacy at the interpersonal level? Uh, so you're a proponent of the military being an arm of cultural diplomacy. Definitely. As because of their important role, I think that's a very legitimate point. How about over here? Uh, let's see, here. Here. Uh, my name is Ozzy Romeo, uh, Arizona State University. Uh, I grew up in France, actually, and when sometimes I could speak English, uh, some you of speak my very French. Well. Oh, I don't think so, but <laughs> some of my friends from France will say, oh, we don't like Americans, really. I don't know, I didn't understand why. And originally from Cameroon, I was just there a few months ago. I met with the government again, and uh, we discussed a lot about uh, bilateral cooperation, multilateral cooperation. I would say the presence of the United States in Cameroon is very appreciated. And I would say, <laughs> It depends, U.S. can revive uh, its position, its leadership, and its, the cultural diplomacy through the different program it has. I believe that it's a matter of trying to contribute in eliminating social injustice ha happening around the world. I think the matter of creating a society where there is cultural diplomacy or coexistence, Pacific coexistence, is all about meeting people's basic living conditions. When people live in peace in their societies, having opportunity to have a peaceful mind, there are chances to consider other people. But when people have issues, trying to blame others, especially when they have people to blame, it's always very difficult. I, so you're a proponent that aid or assist foreign assistance is an important component of cultural diplomacy, okay? Yes, over there. Zeke Botokuma, he said we have four minutes. Not <laughs> all for me, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Zeke Botokuma. Uh, last year, I authored a book titled Obaminon, the, uh -huh. the Gospel of Global Hope, Change, Understanding, and Leadership for a Networking World. Now, one of the things that did include in this publication is what you mentioned about the image of US whenever, I mean, after the election of Obama, and you confirm some of those things. However, the problem is, and that is my question, do you have any idea about what, for example, 
the uh, killing of Geronimo or Osama bin Laden has done in terms of the image of the US in the world, and especially in the Muslim world, where Osama is a kind of hero. OK, he oh, turns. Uh, Madam Madam okay. I'd just like to say one thing. Okay. I think that to revitalize the image of, of America is extraneous, superfluous, really not important. What we have to do is come together as a planet. That's, our, that's the task that I think confronts us all. So these nation, nation states in and of themselves create a problem. And because we, we face certain global uh, problems, and that means, that necessitates that we come together, regardless of what piece of real estate we're standing on. That's, to me, it's just an old way of thinking about things, well, old and new, if you will. And I think that the situation requires that we come together as humanity. We're suffering from the tyranny of time. We run out of time, and there are so many interesting ideas and thoughts. Uh, I think I have to bring it to a close. Uh, because of uh, the next uh, speaker. I would say what you just said, um, you're a man of all tra uh, trades. <laughs> you're also taking a film of this, right? Okay. Just, uh, it's, it's, of course, it would be wonderful if all of us working. around the world, all humanity can get together. But yes. we're talking about cultural diplomacy. And I'm afraid the images impact on what can be done through policy, through whatever. And it matters. So I will just leave it to our next speaker to see what more can be done where cultural diplomacy is concerned to improve our world and to bring, as this gentleman just said, the world together. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much.